sure. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a special live edition of the Friday 15 podcast. This is normally a bonus podcast for our Supporters Club podcast, Supporters Club members, but since we sent John Galt to Serbia, we wanted to go live so we could have some reactions and fans, comments from the fans. Anyways, excited to be here. World Cross Country is tomorrow, one of my favorite events in all of the sport, the world's greatest foot race. This is Let's Run.com co-founder Robert Johnson, the most interesting man in track and field. Because you said something very interesting. I guess your opinions are very different. Joined as always by my genetic equal, identical twin brother Weldon Johnson, as well as a staff writer, Jonathan Galt, who is currently in Serbia. If you're new to this podcast, this is the only podcast I'm aware of on planet Earth that has been listened to by... <coughs> Christian Coleman's dad, Noel Lyles' mom, and Yaka Bingham Britson. We break down the best of track and field today. It's world cross country. John, how is Serbia? We were there together two years ago. I'm jealous that I'm not back. Yeah, I hit some of the same spots. You know, went to dinner last night with Kyle Dennehy around the Old Town area and did a little stroll around. And then the press conference was at City Hall, which was part of our walking tour back in 2024. So, Robert, you know, it's... It's not the same without you. It's not the same without the Johnson brothers at World Cross. You are missed by me. You missed by some of the fans here. There are people have been asking about you, but I'm happy to be here. You know, yesterday I went to the course. There wasn't much buzz. This afternoon, though, pretty much all the teams are out there. Team USA, Kenya, Uganda. You know, everyone's getting used to it. They're figuring out how to run over these hay bales, which could be you know probably the most interesting feature of a fairly bland course by world cross country standards but yeah it's starting to feel like there's a big race here tomorrow which is exciting and i can't wait to talk about it wait a second john people really were asking about rojo 
A, a couple of people asked. Uh, some of the journalists here were wondering where are the Johnson brothers and then the super fans from East Kilbride Athletic Club in Scotland, you know, the guys who wear the yellow shirts and the kilts and come to all the world cross country. Uh, I talked to one of them, David, and he was telling me, you know, he rem remembered meeting us in Uganda and in Aarhus and was saying, where, where are the Johnson brothers? I'm like, oh, it's just me this time. But Robert, I, I should tell everyone, Robert has already picked out where he's going to be hosting the Let's Run Party at the 2026 World Cross Country in Tallahassee. So expect the full Johnson experience two years from now when the USA hosts. Okay, good to hear. We're actually getting this party on the books. But, John, Wednesday night I went to the – they had a run for Evan Gershkovich, the Wall Street Journal reporter who was detained. And I go to that thing, pretty big turnout. I did did my Jordy Beamish is my favorite runner. I mean, I, they said eight minute pace for the fastest group. I'm like, I got this, no problem with the short group. I was hanging on for dear life, but if they said you got to kick for the win, I would have done it. But apart from that, it dawned on me halfway through this run. I'm like, I'm more likely to be recognized. I think walking down the streets in Hungary at the world or Serbia, I guess I hadn't thought about it. And I, I go into the bar afterwards, and there's a, a couple of let's run guys there or one guy in particular, then the host who organized it, it comes as a let's run guy too. But then I'm leaving the bar and a guy goes, Hey, Rojo. And I see this guy and he's not dressed. He's not been on the run. And I'm like, are you here for the run? He goes, what run? <laughs> so some just random dude in New York thought I was Rojo, which wow. proves my point too, that at more of a hobby jogger type run we're not that likely to be recognized but on the streets of new york apparently rojo is and well no it's interesting well then because track athletes in general most of them can just go about their daily daily lives and not get recognized too often but when they're at a big meet you know there's celebrities like boston marathon weekend all the runners are celebs and same with some of these big events and it's like that on a much, much smaller scale for the members of Let's Run.com. Like in my daily life, I think I've one time, actually, no, twice. Once when I was on vacation in Paris and once when I was doing a run around the Boston College campus, have I been recognized as like John Galt of Let's Run.com. Every other time someone sees me and recognizes me, it's a, you know one of these big events where all the running nerds are. All right, enough talk about ourselves. Let's talk about this race. I'm really excited. I mean, I, on Tuesday's show, we talked at length about the men's race. Who is the favorite? Joshua Cheptegei, Jacob Caplimo. Both men have won this story race in the past. And, you know, it, 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 if you actually look at it, we have a poll up on Let's Run. Um, I guess I could try to share it with the live viewers. But – when on Tuesday's show, I just put the poll up and you know, there, there weren't um, a whole lot of results. It's kind of interesting because it's changed a little bit since then. So Jacob Aplamo, the defending champion getting 51% of the votes, Joshua Chepta guy, 31% Eric Gowie, the guy that was fourth in the Olympics when Grant Fisher was fifth, 9% Sebastian Sawway. World Half Marathon champ from Kenya, 2%. Nicholas and everyone else, you know, 1% or less. So I, I think that, you know, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, we, we chapter guy just got beat in a, in a 10,000. We don't know if he was going all out. Maybe you got some information from him today in, 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 at the press conference. But what we didn't really talk about was the women's race. And, John, I, I read your preview. I changed the title a little bit just to hype it up. But I'm super pumped about the women's race. And, and and I think that one of the things about running that's unique about our sport is you kind of have to know, I don't know, I like you can turn on a random, I can turn on a random basketball game, not need to know anything about it and still find it entertaining. With running, I, I like want to know what it means. And so when I read your preview, I was like, God damn, I'm excited about this women's race. And I added in one paragraph to your article to try to, you know, hype things up a little bit. You like to be factual. I like to be more of a PR man. But, you know, I call this the Kenyan women's dream team. And they've gone one through six at World Cross Country in Uganda. Could they do it again? But what I wrote was, prior to the Super Shoe era, one would have thought that the 2024 Kenyan's women roster was part of a bizarre dream. Think about it. In the year 2015, if you dreamed that there would be a women's cross-country team, 
with its projected final score. Fourth woman possessing a 1405 5,000 meter PB and a non score at 2950 for 10,000. That would have been crazy. At the time, the 5,000 world record was 1411, and only one woman in the history had broken 2950. So it's just amazing, like how good those women are, how fast they are. And I don't even think it's all necessarily super shoes. You know, obviously the shoes do help a, a lot at the longer distances, but that team is loaded. Absolutely. I mean, they've got the only two women in history who've broken 29 minutes for 10,000 meters, whether it's track or road. They both did it on the roads in January. You've got Beatrice Chibet, who's the reigning champion, 14.05 for 5,000, third fastest in history. And then, you know, Margaret Kipkemboy, who's another one of their women, consistent top five finisher at World on the track, has medaled multiple times at Worlds on the track. It's just an absolutely dominant team. And that is the big storyline because the Ethiopian team isn't really that strong. Uh, a lot of their top runners focused on World Indoors, so they're not here. Like beyond the, the Kenyans, I don't think it's a super deep meet, but they are really good. You do have Nora Gerudo, who's the 2022 world champion in the steeple from Kazakhstan. She's running here first time since her whereabout suspension was overturned from last season, the provisional suspension. And then Wayne Kaladi's running, and I think Kaladi, you know, she might get beat by five or six Kenyans and could still finish in the top 10 because that's just the way the field is composed this year. Yeah. So the big question to me is who's the favorite? I mean, we, we talked about it a little bit on Tuesday, but you've got Shabbat, 1405 defending champion. The woman beat let's send it at, at Gade last year when Gade, you know, collapsed met, met her from the finish line or Agnes and get it. She's run like 28, 28 40 something on the roads and at the time on tuesday i was like it's got to be in get it. but the more i thought about it i'm like chibet's the defending champion is she really going to get dropped by i mean i guess 28 40 is fast as hell but i i can sometimes think about it like in terms of you know who's going to drop you know and, and the 5,000 is someone's got to be really good. Otherwise, if they don't drop Ingerbitch, then they're going to lose. Well, somebody's got to be insane to drop a 1405 woman, and then she'll probably out kick her. Now, I think the heat is a wild card. I actually think it might help a 2840 something person because it makes the race harder, it makes it longer. It's easier to drop somebody by pushing the base from the front. But you were at the press conference. I think, and Gedditch was there too, John, you know, and, and Chibet. Like, did Chibet talk about whether she was going all out in the Kenyan trials? The only thing that makes me concerned is like, well, you know, she didn't win the Kenyan trials, but maybe she wasn't going all out there. Was not. And I asked her that. I said, you know, did you leave anything in reserve or were you going 100%? And she wanted to be respectful, I think, of her competitors. But at the same time, she said, look, the focus is this race. And reading between the lines, I don't think she went all out of the trials. She just tried to make the team. She knows this is the one she has to be ready for. And... I am looking at the race the same way as you, Robert. Like it's going to take a big effort to drop Chibet because she's so strong. But we did see that happen last year. Like Gide dropped Chibet uh, on the final lap, and then she really fell apart because she miscalculated things. We could have a similar situation tomorrow because the high is going to be eighty-two degrees. So it could be a case of someone makes a big move, but maybe they miscalculate it and they end up wiltering in the heat. The wilting, sorry, wiltering is not a word. Wilting in the heat, the last lap, and Chebet comes back. So it's tough. Like I, I just, I don't think I can pick against the twenty-eight forty-six woman, but Chebet is a really tough runner, and you know she's going to be tough to drop, and you know she has a good kick. So it's going to make for an interesting race, and I think you're going to have to be cognizant not to overexert yourself in the heat because we've seen too many times at this meet athletes chip the guy. In 2017, Gaday last year, Kennedy Sipakele even in 2007, which was much worse conditions in Mombasa. All of those athletes are legends of the sport, and they faltered in the heat at World Cross Country. And that's what makes the race so much fun is because it is a wild card. We, we, running doesn't have the randomness that you sometimes have in other sports, but I think cross country, 
with the heat, you know, you, you can do that. So it's interesting in terms of, you know, the polls, I, I had shared it on the screen there. Chabat is actually the favorite. In the earlier when the voting first came out, it was 50, 50, but now it's 45% are picking Chabat, 32% are, are picking Gedich, And then, you know, 11% other 7% Gerudo, 6% and Yango. So uh, has anyone, is there betting shops that have this? I would love to see the betting odds in these races. Like I am, that would be fascinating. I would definitely, I feel real confident in Caplimo and the women's race. Uh, that's a tough one for me. I, I was saying go with 28 46, but. Well, Jordan know, Donnelly think, here points out in the comments it's going to be a road race, courses flat and rock hard, American style like C. I'd wear super shoes with spikes at the bottom. I didn't even realize that was an option, but Jordan is knows more about shoes than we do. But I, he is right in terms of the course. It's super flat apart from two artificial uh, man-made hills. And the hay bales is a bit of a rhythm breaker, but they'll, you know, they run that once per loop. I do think this is going to be a road race style course though. It, there's really not much to it. it there it is even, even there aren't that many twists and turns, honestly. So I think it's going to play into the favor of the people who can just run really fast from the gun. The only thing that can change that up is the weather forecast, which is going to be what? I mean, there still is enough to disrupt the rhythm, right? It may be more of a road race type course, but there's the hay barrels. You can't run straight through those. There's the mud thing. There's the hill. It's not, I just think it's different than a typical road race. Having said that, I don't know. I mean, you guys almost pushed me off her. I think Ngedish will win. She's at a whole nother level from last year. She, she got beat by Chibet, I think, by 12 seconds last year at Worlds. But, like, you start running 2840. I, I don't know. Maybe I need to readjust because, uh, you know, people don't, I've never heard of her running under sub 29 now. So it's maybe I just need to factor, I, I don't know, add a minute. But 30 minutes for 10K is still pretty good. I don't know. It, it's just nuts. And then I talked to Wayne Kaladi on the course as well, the American champion. She said she's done one workout since the 10. She's feeling confident. You know, I was saying the big thing with you talking to her coach, Stephen Haas, has been bumping up her mileage in workouts and in long runs. I say, you know, do you think that's the reason why – you've taken this leap and why were you hesitant to do that in the past? Just like, I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. You know, I, I was kind of worried whenever you change something, you're a little worried, but she's taken to it very easily has been healthy. And those two things I think has, has seen her take a leap. She's now running 30, 33, 66, 25 and a half. So yeah, she had this comment where she said, you know, I, I said, what do you make of these tw sub 29 women? Is it intimidating at all? She's like, no, you know, good day. I, you can beat them, you know? And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, maybe you need to have a good day and they have to have a bit of an off day. But it reminded me of what happened at world indoors. Ellie St. Pierre ran the race of her life. Good off guy who I thought was unbeatable was a bit off her game. St. Pierre won. So I'm not saying Wayne Claudia is going to be challenging for the win, but she might beat, you know, a couple of these top women, if they're not totally on their game. But I think the top three, I mean, if they're anywhere close to the fitness they were at when they, you know, when Chabet won World Cross last year, when these two women ran sub 29 earlier this year, I don't see Kaladi being close to them. But kudos to her for saying she's not intimidated. And if she does medal, this is going to be one. I mean, this is like a Molly Seidel type performance in Tokyo. Like, U.S. woman has not finished in the top 10 or medaled since 20, was it 2011 or 2013, John? When 2011, won. Shalane Flanagan in Spain. Um, By the way, I spent a lot of time figuring out where the top Eritrean-born woman has ever finished at World Cross Country. I believe it's ninth, only one time in the top 10. I, I think she can get top 10. If she can hang with these women, it's amazing. I like the point Weldon made about cross country. Like, even if it's flat, there's 180-degree turns, there's the hay bales, et cetera. It's, it's not going to be a rhythm race, you know, and, and I think you can – Weldon and, and, and I weren't necessarily great cross-country runners. We, were, we like to get in a nice rhythm just run the same pace the whole way. So it's still cross-country. Um, but, you know, the 2840 woman, 
was third last year in cross country. So she's not like you know, she won the Kenny trial. So it's not like, you know, she, she's horrible at that. I, I think that the heat is a wild card because for me, hot weather running for some people is a different sport almost than, than regular running. But um, so John, who else was that? Tell me who are the, the feature runners at the press conference. Cause we haven't published your article yet. It was Beatrice Chabat of Kenya, the reigning champion. It was Jacob Kiblimo, the men's reigning champion. Caroline Biakeli Grovedal of Norway, who just won the New York City half and has won the last three European cross titles. And I think his first name is Elvan Bibic, uh, Serbia's top athlete. He's running the relay. So that was the four. No chapter guy. All right. I, I was up late last night watching some NCAA basketball games. I guess John was probably asleep. John, be a good thing your Dartmouth Big Green weren't in the Sweet 16. It would been hard to watch. No, but, this year. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was watching these games, and then when I uh, when I decided to go to bed, I I, I did growth. You know, I did what you're not supposed to do. I, I took a look at Twitter, and, you know, I saw another strapping single journalist on there, featured on the World Athletics site, Cathal Denny, friend of Let's Run, he was running the course. They were having him do like the whole course and just, I, I thought it was impressive. And I, and I put on there, can we please have our Jonathan Galt do a course tour with a videographer and then we can compare which is who's more popular, you or him. So did, did you get a chance to do that this morning, John? I really think it would boost the popularity of running if we just at every event had you and Cathal maybe do a shirtless. <sighs> Yeah, uh, fortunately, I think for most people, I was wearing a shirt. But you guys haven't checked out the Let's Run.com YouTube channel? I mean, videos blowing up, like attempt to run over the hay bales. Did, did did you not see this, Robert? Or are you actually trying to – are you queuing me I, up? I didn't see it. No, I, I went to the hay bales because I went to the course this morning before the press conference expecting that's when the teams would be there. It turns out all the teams are not showing up to the afternoon. I thought it was kind of interesting you know, the day before the race, I feel like you'd want to get there early, but no, the course tour was late this afternoon. So I went over to these hay bales, which I think is the most interesting portion of the course because they're arranged similar to those tires in Bathurst last year, where you have to, you either have to weave in and out of them or you have to hurdle them. And in Bathurst, most people weaved in and out because they would have had to hurdle going uphill, which is an extra strain, but this one, you know, if you look at the way I ran it, basically, if you weave, you are losing a lot of momentum because you've got to go to one side and then the other. And it's just, it's a pain. It's kind of like making these all these turns in quick succession, whereas you can keep your momentum going better if you hurdle it. So I basically tried all the approaches. You can either, there are four, there's two on each side, and you can either hurdle both and run in a straight line, or you can try hurdling one and then angling yourself once you land off of there to avoid the next one, which I think that's that's what I would do if I had a free run in it and I was a world-class athlete. Obviously, my hurdle form is not great. Yeah, you can see the picture there. That's what it looks like. But the quite the interesting thing is this like comes around halfway into the first loop, I'd say, and there's going to be a large pack of people. Uh, a couple times, like the lead first, you know, the first loop for the leaders, and then every subsequent loop if you're in the middle of the pack. And I'm wondering, like, how would you approach it in that situation? Because if people start weaving and there's a huge pack, it's going to bottleneck very quickly. But if you start hurdling, like, you know, basically, if, if other people in your group are trying to do something different from what you do, that could lead to total chaos. So I expect the best athletes will all try to hurdle. I think most athletes will hurdle. But maybe if people are feeling exhausting on loop four or loop five, you might start them start to see them weave. But I, I think I would try to hold at least the first one and maybe two, depending on what pack you're in. What do you guys think? Well, it's, John, it's pretty interesting, right? Like, I, so if you heard all the first one, there's a comment here from David Diebel in the comments: a thousand bucks a men's winner takes the hurdle diagonal approach. So you'd hurdle the first one, then go diagonal the second, and hurdle. Oh, well, no, if two. you if you take the hurdle diagonal approach, you would only hurdle the one that's on the left of the screen right now, and then coming off of that, you'd sort of make a beeline right, run in a straight line, and that way you kind of run in between the last two, so you wouldn't have to hurdle them. But it could be 
also some other people might just say that's too complicated i'm just going to go straight forward and hurdle two bales in a row these hay bales are about two feet tall by the way they're probably not as tall as the men's steeple barrier but yeah they may be around the women's steeple height or ish yeah, i'm not sure i can really describe this the way they're staggered you're right if you're gonna do the hurdle diagonal you hurdle the second one and then run out to the right but as yeah. you said john if other i guess if you're leading the pack and you do that then it's probably likely most people behind you do the same thing but otherwise you're sort of at the mercy of what other people are doing because yeah if you're like in the middle of the pack and you try to hurdle and someone's cutting in front of you you're screwed so i can't believe we've really never seen this before all right, good. When, now well, we, we're, we're, we've seen hay bales up on screen. Uh, John, <laughs> well, th those of you watching live, this is amazing, John. Uh, th this is so awkward. We th this we, we need to have a video. We need to just forever put this up and let's run. We, we like what we always say, like some pretty good runner like Cooper Tier. Why doesn't he move to the steeple? And then I'm watching you hurdle. Oh, oh my God, it's awkward. And then even watching you weave in and out looks awkward, John. So, All right, Robert, just th thank goodness it was me instead of you. Like, could you imagine, <laughs> Robert, who doesn't run, <laughs> could you imagine doing this yourself? Like, this is why you sent me to Serbia. It's just flushed. It's because I did my longest run of the year today. 3.9 miles, John. I almost doubled my yearly total. But th this is amazing. First of all, so these hay, hay, hay bales are, two, it's two hay bales high. So, the, you know, two on, stacked on top of each other. Uh, God. I I hope that they do hurdle them, but uh, I think they'll hurdle them because here's the thing: if these hurt, if these hay bales weren't diagonal and they were just sort of square across the course, and there's no way you'd avoid them, everyone everyone would just be like, "All right, we got to hurdle that. We don't have any other choice." Now that they've angled them, you're creating this somewhat illusion of choice. But you know, even I even saw some of the smaller runners running over the you know hurdling these things. So I think most athletes will hurdle them. No, one technique that I would have used, I would put my foot on top and just jump over it. So, like some that. people, you can do that, but it's not quite as stable as a wooden barrier. But you, you might, you certainly could see some athletes doing that. Yeah, John so the eventually photographer over, agrees John? with me. Um, I am being told that there will be stakes in the ground going through the middle of the hay bales that's going to make sure that they don't, you know, lose their mooring or anything like that. So that's my understanding. See, it sounds like a little bit dangerous. By the way, I'm not sure they'd have stakes in the ground in Tallahassee. I'm a little upset John wasn't wearing at least like the let's, you know, we don't have a, we don't have an official apparel sponsor. Like we should have be decked out in our, uh, you know, our blank companies. Well, warm up gear. No, John, John's wearing like a, a nice button down shirt instead of, you could be wearing the let's run t shirt, at least look a little more sporty there, John. But, Robert, uh, I, I told you I had to pull an audible. I went to the course expecting to get interviews and there were no athletes at the course. So I had to improvise and I wasn't wearing running shoes. I wasn't wearing my let's run shirt, the most comfortable shirt on the internet. So that's what you get, Robert, unfortunately. Uh, I love it. This is journalism at its finest. We're going to link to this video in the show notes for those of you listening in a podcast. John, keep up the good work. This is, I, I was like, Am I getting anything out of sending John, spending thousands of dollars? And yes, I am. Yes, I am. By the way, John, you said you've been doing a lot of the same stuff, you know, in City Hall. So we, we did a wonderful historical tour. One thing we didn't do when we were there, but we heard, because you and I aren't this type of person, is that the nightclub scene is huge there. What do you call it? Like the, the dancing? Like the, uh, I forgot what you call it. It's not called yeah. a nightclub, is it? No, I think it's called a nightclub. That was the, yeah. That was what they were telling us to do last time. Last night, I had absolutely no energy for it. I was jet lagged. And honestly, if I'm up at one in the morning tonight, it's probably because I'm going to be watching the NCAA tournament and not going out to some club. So, uh, yeah, I'm two years older than I was then, and I just feel like my clubbing days, I never really had a clubbing prime, but I'm certainly past it. John, win in Rome, win in Rome, baby. And just, you know, you don't need to report back. We'll just keep your mouth quiet. Uh, there's a comment the here. Button. Let's go. From Jordan Donald. John looks good like Rojo, that. How many athletes have you coached to World XC championships? John Kellogg, how many athletes have we coached the World XC championships? You would like as if there's like 10 that you need to count off. <laughs> Come on, Robert. It's been a long time since I was coaching. I was trying to see if we got anyone there. Well, we had someone run the trials. 
I was reading okay. about the baseball managers. Do you know, like, many college baseball managers make more money than MLB managers? What? Yeah, until this, like, the Cubs guy just got $8 million a year, but that's sort of an outlier. Some, there's a, the Vanderbilt baseball manager makes college, this is an American college, so I don't know. I don't know why. Vanderbilt makes $2.4 million a year. Vanderbilt's good in college baseball. They, I mean, David Price went there. They've had some good players. But well, I I, I guess crazy. the the baseball coach in college is is kind of also more like the GM. He has to not only coach the team, he has to acquire the talent. So his role is basically coach and GM. Whereas yeah, but the revenue league, you just the revenues can't be the same as MLB revenues. But anyway, well, well wait, no, I, but I I agree with you. But this is the shows you one of the problems with sports. And I think this is one of the problems with 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 we'll see what happens with track and field at the college level is it's not the administrator's money. So, so some of these values, like they don't make any sense. Like it doesn't make sense to me that a college guy would be making more than a pro guy, but some of them do. And we're like, where are we going to get the money to pay the players? Well, instead of paying John Calipari, $9 million a year, if you paid every player on the team, $500,000 a year, you could just, you'd still have $5 million left to pay Calipari. You know, okay, how did we get on this topic million. anyway, Robert? I think the answer to the question of number of athletes he's coached to world cross country sounds like it's a zero. Uh, let's talk about the men's race. I had a nice chat, Robert, with Anthony Rotich, one of your personal favorites. The He's my pick for the top American. I saw him by the finish line. You know, he was very generous with his time. But he was saying, like, you know, I'm like, you ran the 10. How, are you recovered from that? He just ran a big PB, 27.08. He's like, oh yeah, I just I didn't do any workouts or anything. It's been two weeks, and he's just he's like, if I can get to eighty percent recovered from where I was for that race, I think I'm going to do pretty well because you know twenty seven oh eight that's a pretty solid time. And what's interesting was I was like, you seem like you've made a breakthrough this last couple of years. You you finally PR'd in the steeple last year. It was his first PR for ten years in that event. Ran twenty seven oh eight for ten thousand this spring, and I was like. How, how are you making this breakthrough? He's like, well, when I moved from El Paso to Colorado Springs in 2019, I wasn't doing much mileage. He was topping out about 50 miles a week. He's like, everyone else in the training group, the American Distance Project, was running a lot more. So he figured, I got to do, you know, I got to do at least 70 miles a week. Otherwise, I'm, you know, not going to be able to train with these guys. And that led to injuries. So that led to a groin injury. He just couldn't handle it. And he kind of realized recently, like, I just got to do me, man. I, I don't think my body can handle that kind of mileage, but if I lower it a little bit, I think I can stay healthy and log some consistent training. Obviously, he's quite talented, but he was like, yeah, I wasn't running more than 70 miles a week when I – or sound like it might have been even lower than that. could have been under 60 miles a week, but certainly no more than 70 miles a week to run 27.08 for 10,000, which not many athletes have the talent to do that. Okay, two points. One that shows how far the sport has evolved. Because until your article, John, I had no idea he ran twenty seven oh eight. I just I looked at twenty seven minutes, saw who didn't make it, and I didn't really comprehend that Anthony Rotich really isn't a ten thousand meter runner, and he just ran twenty seven oh eight. And he's American, and I just sort of barely noticed. And then also this also today, March 29th, twenty ninth, twenty twenty four, is the peak of American running. The the decline is now going to start. People will say, "Oh, I heard on the podcast, you don't need to run the mileage." So uh, this all has to end at some point. This is how it started, I assume, back in the 80s. There was probably some yeah. newsletter. Some, somebody read something at one library and then started gossiping. Less mileage is better, and, and that got out there. But now this will probably spread like wildfire. So, well, Yeah, Robert, well, I don't really remember the 90s that well. I was born in 1991. Did you guys – were there telephones or internet? Or was this – were you guys sending smoke signals? How did things – yeah, there wasn't even a let's run.com. So were you just like making crop circles to pass on these distance knowledge lessons? Well, the, 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 on, a, on a serious note, that was like the problem. They're like John Kellogg might live in your town, but you had no you had no access to the information. So people would pick up like runner's world and they were they were basically telling you less is more. And it is interesting about Rochich because when I I think I put this up on YouTube last year when I interviewed him at the USA Championships from last year in Cross, because I've always been a big fan. I was uh, basically it's the same thing that, that um, what you said. He's like, but it, it sounded like he did. He made the same thing when he also got out of college. 
He's like, when I was running in college, I was b- not running very much. I mean, it's not like 30 or 40 miles a oh, week. Th- that's what he said. He, he said that. He said 30, 40 miles a week. This is a guy who won three NCAA steeple titles, won the NCAA mile, and ran 821 in the steeple. And he wasn't doing more than 40 miles a week. And then he tried to run like a pro and didn't do well. Then he went back to less and got okay. And now he's doing less again and, and rocking it. So not – well, this is tough for me because this is like against my my, my my MO and training, but he's one of my favorite guys. So I, I hope that he rocks it. I hope that he's top 20. That would be good. Top 10 well, would the be other amazing. Thing, Robert, I asked him like, so, you know, you there are some people who are saying, oh, they were worried about doing the 10 and world cross. And he's just like, he kind of viewed it. I know I wanted to, you know, the focus has been world cross the whole time. The 10 was just, he kind of just did it for fun and was just like, well, you know, I'm training for World Cross. Might as well get a race in. You know, it's a 10K race. So he didn't think it was an issue at all. Uh, he also wasn't, you know, he wasn't really going for the Olympic standard. He kind of was like, I ran way better than I thought. I didn't think I'd be close to 27 flat. He ended up only missing it by eight seconds. But he said the steeple will remain his priority. He's got the 5K and 10K. He's pretty good at those as a backup. But he's still a steepler. And also proof that this is peak let's run peak American distance running. We're over 30 minutes into this podcast and we really haven't broken down the men's race. I mean, this is crazy, but here we are. We did talk about it on the Tuesday podcast a fair amount, but yeah, let's, let's talk about the big boys. This is billed as the battle of the Ugandans, Jacob Kiplimo, the world half marathon record holder, the defending champion versus Joshua Cheptegei, the Three time world, three time in a row, right? World's ten thousand meter champion, the world champion. record holder at five thousand and ten thousand meters, the twenty nineteen world cross country champion. Yeah, he's won, he's done pretty much everything except run a good marathon, two hundred eight marathoner. So, well, Johnny's run one marathon. Oh, I, I'm t- okay, okay, fine. Well done with your facts. You know, don't let it go in the way of your mar- narrative. But. Oh, do we even need to discuss anyone else in this race before we just break down them? Yeah, we do. I think Berhu Iragawi beat Cheptegei in Australia last year in this race, and he ran 1240 for 5,000 meters last year on the track. It's pretty good. So I, I think it's those three. I do think Sebastian Sawe, who's the Kenyan champion, again, he's the world half champion, but I just think these three guys are a bit, you know, they're a step up from him. But I think it's going to be one of the three medalists from last year is probably your champion in 2024. I mean, it's sort of crazy. I mean, this just shows the nature of our sport. We, we shouldn't totally discount them because if we're talking that can Wayne Kalata get a medal, then obviously Sebastian Sawe can get a medal. But, you know, that the Kenyan champ, the world half marathon champ, like, ah, he doesn't have much of a chance. But the sport is so top heavy. It is. By the way, if you're watching the live show, take a look at this. This is what a Let's Run visitor made. This is copyrighted, by the way, so do not produce this shirt. I almost made this shirt back in the day when Chepta Guy made the 5,000 and 10,000 more records. What do you think, John? Is that... Oh, it's a goat, okay, in the middle. It's like the Kipchoge one. Because it's interesting, Uganda's flag has like a crane on it. So, yeah, I like that if you're a Chepta Guy fan. What do you mean, it's, John? It's, this is one of the best ever, Robert. I would order that right now. All your stupid ideas. Can we start printing more damn shirts? Well, this guy wanted like a lot of money for the design, like $1,000 or something. Oh, it's his design? How much did he want? Yeah. I don't know. No, Robert, you know what's a great idea is your Botswana bullet shot. That, that needs to be in the Let's Run shop. shop. Now, I'm not sure how many people you get it because we have a lot of American readers and you'd be rooting against the American sprinters, but I do like the Tobogo Botswana bullet uh, mock-up that you sent us. Well, are you trying to say something you didn't unmute yourself? The shirt that had a it was kind of like a condom or sperm swimming through the bullet part. Anyway, <laughs> that's what you thought of. Well, thought the father of two, fine, but fine tune it a bit. 
Got in and well, out. No, I, I, just, I, I thought having a bullet in general is kind of co- controversial in 2024, right? I mean, the Washington Bullets had to change their team name, but for a sprinter, I feel like the Botswana Bullet is a great nickname. I'll find a picture of the Let's Want a Bullet t-shirt and put it in the show notes. All right, we're getting sidetracked. I only wanted to do, look, uh, we're, just, we're going to do a live show tomorrow after the meet. And I, I was like, okay, that'll be enough. It's, you know, because the meet's early in the morning tomorrow f- for the U.S. So, uh, but I was like, you know what? The supporters club members are the best. Let's do a quick show on Friday. Get the insight. What does John learn from actually being there? So, you know, on their ride home from work, they can listen to, you know, I thought we'd only be on for 15 or 20 minutes. Now it's been already more than 30. But in case you're wondering what times, under 20 women's race, 6 a.m., 635 under 20 men's race, mixed relay, 715. Women's senior race, 745. Men's senior race, 830. Those are all U.S. Eastern time. So it's going to be a tough way to watch on the West Coast. But, hey, if you can't get up that early, you know, on the West Coast, sleep in. By the time you wake up, the Let's Run recaps will probably be up. And then we're going to be doing a live show at 12 noon. I, I thought that was good. It would give the West Coasters time to wake up, time for John to get the interviews, probably finish the recaps, and, and then we can sort of break down the break down the, the piece, you know, the race and the concentrated thing. But world's greatest foot race. I love it. I'm excited. Anything else, guys? I think you guys, we need to make picks for the men's race. Oh, we sure. barely discussed it. We said it's a three person, two person, a three person race, and we didn't actually get our picks on the record. So I want picks for the men's and women's individual titles at World Cross Country, the big gold medals. Who are you guys going with, men and women? Well, I'm sort of shocked. Does like Robert have an appointment or something? Like we barely even broke down this men's race. What but, do you mean? Walton keeps saying that. We, we've talked about the two people that are worth talking about about for 10 minutes. I and mean, there's nothing else to talk about. So, well, oh, Chapter Guy, the one thing I, I learned a couple of things about Chapter Guy. I told to his agent, I should say this. One, I said, were you going all out when you, when was he going all out when he ran his 2653 in T- Toledo or was he just trying to get the standard? And he said, yeah, we were just going to go knock the standard out. He didn't have the Olympic standard. You can get it on the roads. Then we found out Kajelch is coming in and trying to run a world record. He was just like, I don't need to do that. I'm just going to get the time, focus on world cross. And he also said he was starting from like the third. I don't know how this could happen. They had a, ro- a race with Joshua Cheptegei in it. He's not starting right at the very front, but he said he got caught up in the start. And so it took him a little time to get up to the front. So, yeah, he – he that 2653 i think he's in a bit better shape than that the other thing i asked him about was like this marathon debut you know how was he rebounding from it because obviously he ran 208 and it didn't go that well in valencia and his agent yuri vandervelden was just saying you know well he went out in 60 30 for that race and he, he just probably wasn't ready to do that in his debut and that's okay you know they kind of learned if he had run out gone out a little slower he probably would have run a little faster wouldn't have died as hard but also it was kind of a lesson, like, you know, you might be able to run for, you know, run hard for six weeks or eight weeks of hard workouts to really get in great shape for a track race. The marathon, you need a bit longer buildup. And I think that was a lesson he's learned. It's one he'll take to his next buildup. And I expect he'll run a lot better in the marathon, which will be, you know, his event after the 2024 Olympics in Paris. But the way Yuri viewed it was like, it was, it was kind of a learning experience, but sometimes that can help. Well, I, that's good to know that he wasn't going all out. It's also, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Like the It's amazing how, as good as this guy is, and he keeps winning, you know, 10,000s at the World Championships. He won the 5,000 at the Olympics. But for some reason, because, because he's not unbeatable, like it, we're used to like Mo Farah, Bekele, Gebersolesi, like not losing during their prime. And this guy will occasionally lose. But he's a world record holder, so it, it, it's insane. I, I was debating whether he was even the best guy in Uganda on the track last year, and we didn't get a chance to see because Caplimo got hurt. And it's really going to be interesting what happens on Saturday. My pick, though, I'm not being swayed by the but but by by the agent, Caplimo for the win. Yeah, I'm going Caplimo as well. Just he did say that it's interesting. I was like, are you in better shape than you were last year when you won? He's like, you didn't really want to answer that, but 
that he said, I wasn't even in that good shape last year. Like compared to 2021, when he got the bronze at the Olympics in the 10K and ran 5731 half marathon world record, he said that was when he was in his best shape. So yeah, I, I still think he's going to be fit enough to win. And Kip Limo is my pick. But I, you know, I think there's other two guys that we mentioned, Aragawi and Chip, the guy have a chance. Weldon, who are you going with? Yeah, I got to go with Kiplimo too. I mean, we're sort of debating whether Chepta guy went all out in a 26-53 Kinke. That's because Kajel just smoked him in that race. But Kiplimo, I mean, he missed the track season last year, but he ran 26-48 in Valencia. It's only five seconds faster. But, you know, there's really no questions about it. Then he won the Ugandan trials. There's no questions about his fitness. He won last year, very dominant. And people were fit right so there's some sort of question we have a few doubts about chep to the guy we were even speculating last time is kiplimo going to even be better than him at the 10k i mean so i think it's sort of crazy but i think we're all essentially saying we think kiplimo is the favorite yeah and th that's not meant to disrespect chep to guy i think he'll be up there in the mix it's just Limo won this race last year and ran well on the track. I think he's still, you know, he's still my pick. But I, I think they're both very, very good. Women's race. I'm going and get it. I'm just blinded by this 2846. I think that's a, this is a 10K race. She's in good shape. She won the Kenyan trials. I think she's going to win tomorrow. But what do you guys think? Is either of you riding with Beatrice Chabat, the defending champ, or with someone else? Somebody pit, better pick Chibet, but it's not going to be me, John. I, too, am blinded by the 28 minutes. Rojo? I'm going to go with Chibet. I said 28.47 on Tuesday, but the more I think about it, I'm like, the 14.05 is only equivalent to like a 29.30. This is 28.40. I, I I I just thought like okay she won last year, but the other girls made a huge breakthrough and was third. God, I'll I'll I'll, I'll be different and say Chibet, but I, I kind of I don't know. It, it, it'd be fascinating if running is just at a well, it's not a new level because you know Gaday and then we're running twenty nine oh one. So I, I guess we thought that somebody could could run the thing. By the way, if, if you're watching the live show, I found the butts want a bullet shirt. Here it is. Blue and white, blue and white, butts want a bullet. Copyright, so Robert Johnson. Any theories on why the Africans are disproportionately good at cross country? Are there any theories of why the Africans are disproportionately good at like, it's, it's not Africans, it's like Kenyans and Ethiopians and Ugandans, basically, sometimes Eritreans, East Africans. And, and they're also good at the, really good at the marathon. It's not, not just cross, cross country. But yeah, it's the same um, reason as the marathon and the longer distance races. Plus, you add in they're some of the only country they consistently send good teams and full teams to these events: Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And they also get their top athletes to do it. Like the U the U.S. sends good teams, but sorry, the U.S. sends full teams, but not always the best athletes. Other countries, Europe. I'm looking at you. Might not even send individual athletes like Italy used to have Italy. I think until this year was ever present. They'd always run world cross country, had at least one person. They don't have anyone this year. So yeah, it's, they have a lot of really good athletes. And then they also set the federations, take this seriously and send those athletes to world cross. Yeah. I think it's sad. Italy was one of five countries that, that had been, um, you know, to every world cross. So now it's down to four. I saw that somewhere, John. I don't know if you could figure out which countries it is. I think it's France, Spain, Great Britain, and the USA. I want to say, but I'm not. A, don't quote me on that. But but my thought process on this would be: oh, well, they're better at distance running in general. I, I think that also they're more likely to get their top runners to do this. The U.S. has little shots of individual medals, so they skip it. And the U.S. runners are make a ton of money on the shoe contracts. They don't need to go. In African countries, 
particularly with Kenya, they, they somehow like they get money from, I don't know if it's the government or, you know, police, armed forces, whatever, but them running this, A, they don't have as big shoe contracts, but B, I think when they run this, they end up getting money. You know, I don't know if it lasts for life, but from there's more of a financial incentive for them to do this race. So they get their best people too. And I do think they might be better at cross country because, you know, I'm not a whole lot into the whole idea of like, oh, they, you know, they run to school every day. The Americans don't. But I do think that like when they run, you know, a lot of the time it's on uneven ground, dirt roads. Um, so, you know, their their ankles and stuff are stronger growing up. Whereas, you know, growing up in Dallas, Texas, Weld and I are running on pavement our entire life. So. We got, yeah, we, we, just got the, we, got, we got the shoe execs left and right. I, I, I'm amazed these shoe companies, John, just like when you show up at these hotels, Mike McManus, he's now with Hoka, used to be with Adidas, right? Like I'm surprised when you show up at, at your hotel, John, there's just not like a box of like Hoka's, Ons, Nikes, and they're just be begging for you to wear them because, you know, you you go out in the town kind of like you're kind of like the Kate Middleton of, of, of the cross-country journalism, the people, people, people taking pictures of you, Women, middle-aged women will be trying to buy this gear now to impress you. And, you know. Okay, Robert, did you take some sort of hit of a drug before <laughs> that last comment? I don't know what you're talking about, but we need to wrap this thing up because yeah. I do have a story to file from Belgrade. You know, I was at the course. I want to write about what I saw, what I heard. I know that you, I shared it with our listeners, but we also have our readers as well who might be working right now. So I'm going to get to work on that. Then I'm going to have dinner and then I'll, you know, be up bright and early to head to the course tomorrow. Okay. One point of clarification. I think Mike's been with Hoka probably like a decade at least, Robert. I mean, Hoka sort of goes like this and Mike's time sort of, there's a huge overlap. You know, correlation doesn't cause causation, but also, you know, got to kiss up to my, I don't think, Mike, are you still in New York? Put in the comments. I don't think so. At one point we lived like within a, on the Upper West Side in New York. That was pre-COVID, pre-COVID. And then John, people are asking, what kind of crowd is expected? Or do we not know that until recently? Uh, we don't know. I think Sebco is kind of making a plea at the press conference, like it's a world championship, come out and support it. I don't, I don't know. The organizers didn't say like, oh, the demand is amazing. We're gonna have so many people, but it's a city of like 1.3 million, 1.7 million, I guess, depending on where you draw the limits. I was going to say initially, like when I got in here, it was kind of hard to tell, like there wasn't any signage, but then I did see some signage promoting the meat. Granted, not as much in the downtown area. So I don't know. I'll report back. You, you would think like if you could get all these Australians to Bathurst, which is basically in the middle of nowhere, you should be able to get a lot of Serbians out. The thing is, do Serbians like cross country? They like hosting these events. They had Eurocross here in 2013. They had... World indoors in 2022 had good crowds. They had Euro indoors 2017. So I'm I'm hoping for a good crowd, but I, I honestly have no idea. I think, all right. We're just a new, new comment from Lisa. Rojo is looking hot today. This show is going to keep going. I'm feeling good. 3.9 mile run, John. And I also, like, you know, I'm excited because I was doing the homepage on. I guess it was yesterday. Uh, I normally do it Wednesday, Thursday nights. And I was so devastated because I, I go to like 50, 60 websites. And then I do you an RSS, RSS reader to go to obscure sites. And one of them, it says, Bikile out of London Marathon with injury. And I was like, man. And it said from like eight hours ago. And I'm like, why isn't anyone talking about this? Why isn't there a thread on this? I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to start it. This, this is the end. He's done. So I, I, I clicked on the link and was starting to make a thread about it. And then I looked at it, and sometimes RSS feeds, sometimes get, things get republished. It was from like six years ago. I think <laughs> he pulled out of London. So he's been battling the injuries. The good news is Bikili is not out of London, so the Olympic dream continues. Yeah, also good news. You guys realize the Boston Marathon is two weeks from Monday? I've been getting emails and stuff from them. Well, then they, Chris Lotzbaum of the BAA 
was telling me, you know, they've got their, they're tapping the keg of the Sam Adams Boston Marathon brew, the 26 point, I think it's the 26.2 brew uh, on Thursday. And I couldn't go because I was in Serbia, but yeah, wow. Two weeks away. Hopefully it's going to be nice weather in Boston on Marathon Monday, but yeah, we're, we're, we're getting into spring marathon season folks. So it should be fun. I guess, does that mean we can't go as press because we didn't apply for credentials? What do you mean, we? Well, other than me. I, I applied. I, I don't know what you guys have been doing, but I'm sure that let's run.com, well, I'm fairly confident we have enough clout in the running world to get a credential for Boston if you if you still want to go, but you got to get on that. All right, everybody. Till tomorrow. Signing off.